When we take ourselves back to the days of Moses and we imagine how they must have felt when they're facing the strong waters of the Red Sea. And as they look up and they see behind them Pharaoh's army, they're encroaching upon their space. They don't have much space left. And imagine, as the Bible says, they had fear. They were fearful because of what's taking place. So they begin to talk, and you could put yourself there. What choices do we have now? And it was, because there wasn't any graves in Egypt, you took us out here to die in the wilderness. Is that what it was, Moses? We're complaining about, to, you know, to Moses about God, the way it's happened. But Moses, is that why you brought us up at, out of here? We told you, leave us alone. I'd rather be a slave to Pharaoh than to die out here in the wilderness. And Moses says, don't fear. You know, be still. Get a hold of yourself. Because you're going to see the salvation of Jehovah today. And these Egyptians that you fear, you'll never see them again. Because this is the day in which God is going to save you. Save you from Egyptian bondage. We know the story and we know how it ended. But we also know the glory that is being expressed with God in this miraculous work he's about to do for them. In saving them. Despite they had no clue this is going to happen. They were thinking about their situation without thinking about God. Be still. You don't need to fear. Be still and see what God has in store for you. Well, it turned out well that day for the Israelites. And what we see is what happened after that. There is a song that Moses and the people seen following this moment in which they are redeemed and I want you to know how many pro, how many pronouns do you have that says I I'm redeemed we're special you don't see that the song is all about God the song is all about the glory of God and our salvation and I think that's instructive because what it does, it says that when we understand how glorious our salvation is, you won't have to prod people out of bed to go worship. Every time the doors are open, every opportunity we have, we will be going to worship because we realize he's the God of our salvation. And salvation is wonderful. I think we see that with these people. And so let's look at the psalm real quickly. In Exodus, the 15th chapter. Because Moses sang it with the children of Israel, and his song is sung unto Jehovah. I'm worshiping God today because of what God has done for us through this Red Sea. He triumphed gloriously. It's all about God. I will, I will sing unto Jehovah. I'm singing. For he had triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider have been thrown into the sea. That's who we feared. Jehovah is my strength and song. And he has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. He's my strength. He triumphed gloriously. I will sing to him. Because what indeed he has done for me. Jehovah is, is a man of war. Oh, how gloriously he fought the battles for us. Jehovah is his name. Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots. The host are cast in the sea. His army, his chariots, his chosen captains. They're the best leaders of the Pharaoh army. They're sunk into the Red Sea. The deep covers them. They went down the depths like a stone. Later he'll say like lead. But he is indeed that man of war. Oh, thy right hand, O oh Jehovah, is glorious in power. He dashes the pieces of the enemy. You see, he's victorious 
excellency is set forth in verses 7 through 10. And it's connected with his wrath. It's connected with his power. Because you've overthrown them. They've overthrown them that rise up against thee. Thou send forth thy wrath. It consumes them as stubble. It's like fiery wrath. Excellency. He overcomes those that are trying to overcome him. He's excellent in that regard. And with the blast of his nostrils, the blast of thy nostrils, O Jehovah, the waters were piled up. The flood stood upright as a heap. The deeps were congealed in the heart of the sea. I love that word. Because I, I, I can get a hold of jello, <laughs> and I can see it congealed. And their walls. Only God could do that. There's no mold to do that with, to make jello. But it's congealed. And it says, it's in the heart of the sea. And the enemy said, I'll pursue, I'll overtake, I'll divide the spoil. We're going to be victorious. After all, children are walking on dry land. We're going in after them. He said, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind. Like breath out of your nostrils, blowing that wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. In verse 11, Jehovah, we're still talking to you. We're still worshiping you. We say, who is like you? Nobody's like you. Among the gods, who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. People don't do this. It's miraculous works. Only God could do that. And you stretch out thy right hand and the earth swallowed them. As the waters came upon them, the earth swallowed them. It just happened to be water. Thou in thy loving kindness, in verses 13 following, thou in thy loving kindness has led the people thou hast redeemed. You redeemed the people from Egyptian bondage. And the peoples have heard they tremble as the enemies in, on the island, on the, on the west coast, Philistia. Edom and Moab on the east, right in the middle, Canaan. They realize there's indeed a God in Israel. And they have that respect, respect for them. And all the inhabitants of Canaan are melted away in verse 15. And then in verse 16, that's not the end of the psalm because God's getting ready to take the people and they'll be crossing the Jordan River, and they'll be going into Canaan. Terror and dread falleth upon them by the greatness of thy arm. They are still as, 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 as a stone, till thy people pass over, O Jehovah. Till the people pass over that thou hast purchased. I've redeemed these people. I've purchased these people. They belong to me, and I'm bringing them by the power of my right hand into the land of Canaan, whose heart's melting because of the God of Israel. The place, O Jehovah, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have indeed established. They're coming there. He's going to establish that sanctuary where the holy presence of God is, pointing down the future of the idea of the temple for the people that will be dwelling in that land, as that indeed it will be established established in verse 17. And finally, the Jehovah will reign forever. It's all about God. It's all about God. I'm singing. I'm redeemed. But all the glory goes to God. And we see what, what happened. That is worship. Expressing a one event the various deep, different facets that point to God in all of his glory. And we say, well, how, how did that, you know, how does that come about? <laughs> well, chapter 14 and verse 30, Jehovah is the one that saved us. He saved us out of the hand of Egypt. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw the great work that Jehovah had indeed done, destroying the enemy, the Egyptians of this occasion. And the people feared Jehovah. They believed in Jehovah. 
and they believed in his servant. The one they're complaining about before the event happened, Moses. And when you have God on your mind that way, let's take our hymnals and let's sing praises to God. And you will open your mouth wide from the depths of your heart and you will appreciate. You'll appreciate the opportunity to worship a God who has redeemed you and purchased you and bought you and saved you. In our case, from the bondage of sin. I can imagine what it was like to have to trust in God if you're young and a child and you see the congealed walls of the sea on your right hand, on your left, and you're walking this path and it's dry land. God's nostrils made it dry. And the Egyptians say, I'm going in after them. And as we see in the events of chapter 14 unfolding, is that indeed God was bringing them into that and God would take off their wheels. God, and they will drive it hard. The chariots, what's left, and they'll drive it right into the dirt. And the walls come, of water come back down, just a flick of a rod. Moses. And these people realize, I believe in his servant, Moses, because of the events that took place. And they were ready to worship. I wonder sometimes if we're not ready to worship because we haven't thought very deeply about how glorious God is. He's provided your clothing. He's provided your food. He's provided your transportation abilities. He's provided everything for us. And so we will want to worship God when we have that proper perspective of him. And this was the day in which they did that. Now, when we think about our salvation, it hinges in three areas, and it starts with the virgin birth of Christ. Matthew 1, 18 through 24, Mary is already with child before she had relationships with the one she's betrothed to, Joseph. And the angel appears to Joseph to explain to him that she's conceived of the power of the Holy Spirit. But you're going to have a child. You're going to name himself Jesus. Why? Because he's going to save his people from their sins. He's going to fulfill prophecy 750 years before he came. He's going to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah 7 and verse 13, when indeed a virgin, a virgin, she's going to give birth. And you'll call his name Emmanuel. Because it means God is with us. God is with us in the flesh. Conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's going to be our Savior. If God were to break into man's history and show his glory, what a place to do it with a virgin birth. That doesn't happen. that transcends the natural order of things. And that's the beginning of us having a Savior. And God would offer himself so that indeed we could be saved. And oh, what he went through, Jesus Christ. The scourging that took place, the crown of thorns, mockery and painful, but the Bible says he did it for us. In Romans 5, verses 8 and 9, that we are to be able to behold uh, the love that God has, that has been manifested. He committed his own love toward us that while we were in our sins, we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. He died for us. We deserve to die. Wages of sin is death, and we deserve that because we sin. He paid the penalty. Who was sinless, he paid the penalty for our sins and our guilt in order to take it out of the way. And to sober your thinking just up a little bit, oh, I've been cleansed by my sins, and I'm, I feel wonderful about that. You know what he says? But much more, more than that. 
You've been saved by, from the wrath of God. Oh, we don't talk about God's wrath. Yeah, you should, because it's real. Much more than being now justified by his blood. That's wonderful. We're also saved from the wrath of God through him. The wrath of God is upon sin. It's been revealed from heaven. God's angry with sin and the sinner. But he loves us. So what's so great about the salvation? That he would go through the pain on the cross. To die in place of us. So he could live. There's our Savior. And Paul will be proud to preach Christ crucified. The cross, which was indeed deplorable. That's not the way you want to die. Very, very evil people die that way. And Jesus, who was righteous, did. And he did that for you and me. But that's not the end of the story. While the virgin birth is a miracle, resurrection from the dead is a miracle. How would you know what would be a way that God, who is indeed above our little bubble called the universe, in the unseen realms of eternity, just outside of being in parallel with us, but he intersects sometimes. Parallel lines don't do that, but he does. Virgin birth, here's that cruel death that society would say, only the unworthy people do that. And here's the resurrection that transcends our experiences. It stands out. Yes, he was crucified according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. We have a lot of witnesses. Some of them are living that you could talk to in Paul's day. But just the fact of his resurrection, that if Christ was not raised, we're still in our sins, he would argue in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, I love his death, but if he's not raised... We're still in our sins because that was the whole picture. That's about our salvation. Now, my question this morning, is that any less glorious than the congealed walls of the Red Sea and the dry pathway for God's people and the covering up of all the Egyptian army of that day? Is this less glorious than the redemption through the Red Sea? Do we think of this as glorious? I got two miracles in it. <laughs> and I got one humbling themselves to a death that I would cringe to have to think about doing. And I don't take sin lightly anymore when I consider this because God's wrath upon sin was such that he would allow that for his son and demand the shedding of blood in that manner, so that we could be forgiven. We don't take sin lightly when we think seriously about the cross of Christ. Jesus is God in the flesh. He transcends natural law. He created, brought it all to being. He's the, he's the word. Why would he ever be amazed at anything in this world. The Bible says he was amazed at the cross. He was praying in the garden and he was amazed. Because he's getting ready to experience that, which he hadn't experienced before. And he did that for you and me. You don't rise up from that worship service and go out here and sin real quickly or thinking it's no big deal. And you realize this is so glorious that I want to sing a song of praise to him. And so that's what we find ourselves in, in worship. So I ask you, what is behind these words of worshipful praise? 1 Timothy 1.17 is the American Standard Version. 
Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Let it be so. Amen. That sounds like worship to me. Theologian might call it. There's a doxology for you. That's a word of praise right in the middle of a letter. My question is, what lies behind those words that we would say, that's worshipful praise? Just to break out with that kind of praise. You know what lies behind it? Our salvation. And Paul said it's personal to me. Because here was one that persecuted Christians. It's interesting that he can remember his evil works without the guilt of sin any longer. But you don't take away the memories. Of what he put Christians through that he's willing to die for the same cause today. But we drop back in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15. Faithful is the saying. And worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. And he said, I am a chief because of, it's on his mind, of what he's done to persecute Christians. I'm chief of sinners. How bit for this cause I obtain mercy. What cause that? And me as chief might, that should, that, that those who should after their believe on him unto eternal life. There would be an example for them that are going to believe on me, Jesus Christ, unto eternal life. And so he, he became a, a, a type, a sense of mold, not just an example, but in sample. Of the fact that indeed he saved me, he can save everyone that believes on his name. That's verse 16. And verse 17 is the worship service. It's the words of praise. For what? Our salvation. And it's the glory of God. Of what he's done that we realize this is so glorious. That these are the best words I can offer right now. And they... I just want these things to be so he's eternal. There's no death connection with him. I can't see him, but I know he's there. He's the only God. Glory and honor forever and ever. And let it be so. You had to prod that out of Paul. Well, he writes by inspiration, but his heart's in this one. He's writing as God allows him to write what's in his heart. So what's behind these words of worshipful praise? It's our, indeed our salvation. You ever wonder why when it speaks about that whole plan of salvation, it all ends up to whom be the glory forever and ever? That's, that's worship. That's praise. And it, it just comes out in the writings of Paul while he's writing on, on great themes. He's in a context of saying, here the Jews, they went against God so the Gentiles could be saved. Have you ever thought about that plan? How would that work out? Here are the Jews who Jesus is indeed a Jew. And his own people rejected him. And this allowed God's plan to save the Gentiles. That's how it worked out. Who would have ever thought about that one? All the depth and the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past tracing out. You couldn't figure that one out. He's that high Above us in wisdom. For who hath known the mind of the Lord to be his counselor? That didn't, that didn't come about in God's plan of salvation. Man wouldn't have thought of it that way. Who hath first given to him that it should be recompensed unto him again? God doesn't need anything from us. For of him and through him and unto him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. There's your doxology. Because one is just captivated with the glory that's behind our salvation. Paul closes his epistle in chapter 16 and verse 25. When he speaks that here is this gospel that was kept silent. The prophets of old talked about it and now it's come about. 
But he says in verse 26, but now is the but now is manifested by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God is made known unto all the nations. Now Jew and Gentile, obedience of faith. And what comes next to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. That's a good way to end the epistle. Let's talk about the great theme of salvation and let's end it with worshipful praise. Our salvation is glorious. And sometimes we need to pause and think about that. And what it'll do, it will enrich our worship. And it will cause us to want to worship God. Because see, in Exodus the fifteenth chapter, or third Exodus 15, it speaks about something that's getting ready to happen as they go over, they'll be over the Jordan River and they're planted in Canaan, established on the mountain. And he talks about the fact of what will occur. But what happened on this day, they were redeemed from Egyptian bondage. Well, through the glorious plan of salvation, what are we redeemed from? Are we redeemed? Redemption price is paying to free a slave. And the Bible teaches us that we were in the bondage of sin. We were slaves to sin. We could not get out of that because we had no redeemer. So what happens? Here comes Jesus. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 18, we find that here is the blood of Christ that redeems us. Knowing that you were redeemed not with corruptible things, gold, silver. No. But with the precious blood as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, even the blood of Christ. We were redeemed from slavery. Being slaves to sin. Paul puts himself as one that has a mindset that I want to serve God, but he has the flesh that he gives into that flesh. And under a system of law, this is how he describes himself in verse 24, wretched man that I am. That's not a Christian talking. That wretched I am, I'm still a Christian, I'm wretched. No. This is a man under a system of law realizing this is what it's like. I do the things I don't want to do. And I am under this bondage. Who shall deliver me out of the body of this death? Does that sound like a Christian talking? No. We're redeemed. He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he opens into chapter 8 and verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life. That's the gospel laid down. The law of the spirit of life. Made me free from the law of sin and death. That's not the law of Moses. That's the law of sin and death. That under the law of Moses. I'm, I have. I'm under that law. I need to be free from that. Free from the bondage of sin. Who did that for me? God did. Through his son. His blood redeemed me from that bondage. That we can have forgiveness. God be glorified. And secondly, God's sanctuary has been established. That's what Moses and his song is looking forward to. Where God's holy presence is going to be. Oh, that's going to be the tabernacle we're going to be in. We're wandering. We're getting ready to start on those, those journeys with the law. And then we'll have the, the temple established in, in Jerusalem. Oh, it'll be a wonderful thing. Oh, it'll be caught, torn, torn down. But before Christ comes, we'll build another one. May not be as glorious as it was before. But the remnant's going to have that. Jesus is going to come. Oh, Herod's temple was magnificent when Jesus walked upon the earth. What Jesus established for us, he established his sanctuary, and we're part of that. The church made up of Christians is indeed a part of that. Paul, in dealing with disrupting the unity of the church in Corinth, he says, this is what you're messing with. Know ye not that ye are a temple of God? You're a sanctuary of God. 
You, you Corinthians are. And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. It's holy sanctuary. And it's God's people who comprise the church in this context. If any man destroyeth the temple of God, you're going to destroy this church with division. God will destroy. For the temple of God is holy. And such are ye. Oh, it's not stone and wood and sealed rooms. It's people who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ and this spiritual kingdom called the church. And it's where Christ's holiness camped out. It's where he manifests himself in all of his glory to the lives that we start living. In chapter 6, he said, that's going to be a holy life. And that's your personal body, dear Christian. We're to flee fornication. He tells us in verse 18, know ye not that your body is a temple, a sanctuary, a most holy place for the presence of God? It is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have from God. You're not your own. Remember Moses, speak, you were purchased. You're redeemed. This is your great salvation. Well, this is our great salvation. We are the sanctuary of God. And our personal bodies, we were, we not only, we were bought with the price, glorify God, therefore, in your body, in my body. Don't destroy the collectivity. That's, God dwells in us as God's people in the church. But each one of us is an individual. I've been bought with the price. I've got my own. So when you think about your salvation, you realize God has established redeeming people and establishing his sanctuary, just like Moses promised his people when they sang a song of worshiping God. And in it all, God is glorified. Isaiah 2 speaks about the mountain that's going to be established for God's people to come and hear the law of God and the word will come out of Jerusalem. Joel 2 and verse 28 speaks about the Holy Spirit coming upon all flesh. And those two come together in Acts 2. When on that day of Pentecost, they were in Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, and Joel 2, 28 is being fulfilled. And that gospel sermon that set forth Jesus as our Savior, and that people were going to submit to that gospel, and those that did were baptized. When they were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift, that promise of salvation from the Holy Spirit. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as were being saved, according to the King James, in Acts 2, 40, 46 and 47, as that, as that second chapter so the things that were prophesied a mountain and a sanctuary being established, it was, it was fulfilled. And we need to think, as we're doing this morning, this is glorious. This is something that I need to think about. And what I'm saying, it will help us in our worship. Because the last part of that song is that God reigns forever. And we can say amen to that. And we're going to be a part of that. Because we're making our Christ, the, the, we've been bought by him, we glorify him. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12, he's writing to Christians, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. We're going to reign with him. In Revelation 22, or Revelation 3 and verse 21, here we see a, a, a church, and tell me who this church is that's getting this promise from God. Because in chapter 3 and verse 21, we said, here's the promise of then him that overcome. You're going to overcome? He's speaking to a church. I will give to him to sit down with me in my throne. I'm going to reign with him. Just like I overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. What church is promised that he will be able to sit, they'll sit down with Jesus and his throne, just like he overcame and sat down with his father on his throne? Who is that? 
that lukewarm, sickening church located in Laodicea. That's who it was. Be zealous and repent, brethren. I will come in and sup with you and you and me. We can have fellowship again. And you know what? You will reign with me. We should never think, well, we're past being helped at all. No, God's going to reign forever, and we're going to reign with him. And we come to the end of the Bible in Revelation 22. We find in verse 5, verses 1 through 5, that here coming out of the throne is this living river, water of life. And it's coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Is that two thrones? Same throne. It's the throne of God and the Lamb reigning together. And you and I can be a part of that. And what happens is that, verse 3, there shall be no curse anymore. The throne of God and of the Lamb shall be therein. And his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. So we'll see him face to face, and we're at, we, we have the mark, which is symbolic. I belong to you. I belong to you, Lord. I see you in all your glory, and I belong to you. No night anymore. We don't need the light of the lamp, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God shall give them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Who's they? You and me. From lukewarm churches that got warm again, if we ever get to that state. From people who rejected Christ and now say, I'm going to come to him. And those who have just quit walking with God, no, endure, come back to him. And what brings us back is this great salvation that we're thinking about today. And it ends with us reigning forever. And that's the best we can describe it. But you and I are going to live it one day. And that's kind of what Moses sang about. But we're able to sing about it in the terms of the glorious things God has done for us in saving us from our, from our sins. The Bible speaks about that day as a day in which people were baptized unto Moses in the cloud, as the cloud hovered over them, guiding them, protecting them, and in the sea. They walked right into the midst of the sea. They were engulfed with the waters on each side, and he calls it baptism, being immersed. Not only in the cloud overseeing them, being immersed under the cloud, but they were under the walls of the sea of water, water they were under. Gloriously so. They congealed. Why were they going to come in? I don't know. But let's keep walking. And they can look back when they get through and the water start collapsing upon the enemy. What a man of war. What triumph. What glorious triumph. And he said they were baptized into Moses. Remember, they started believing in their, the servant Moses again when they went through that baptism of the sea. Did you know our baptism is unto the Lord? Well, I've got to be baptized. I've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus. I've got to be baptized according to his authority, and that's true. But Acts 19 and verse 5, it says I'm baptized into the name. Pointing toward the name. Pointing toward his authority. Because I'm going to be his disciple. I belong to him. See the mark on my forehead at the end of time? I belong to Jesus. I see him all of his glory because I try to be pure as he is. Knowing oh, I'm going to see him face to face. Not perfect, but I endured. And I repented. And I turned back. And I came back serving the Lord. But that moment when I was baptized, I was not baptized just in because of his authority. I wasn't just baptized to get into the benefits of his death and resurrection. But I was baptized into the name, into his authority. I belong to him. And that's how you start. And it starts with a baptism just like that glorious day started with the Israelites for a baptism. 
And when you begin that day, oh happy day, when my sins were washed away. I realize time moves on, but we should never forget that moment. And you know what? Maybe we could sing a song of praise. And take time to do that. And I want to just close because redemption purchased people, glorious, triumphant God, and how he destroyed the enemy in Moses' day, and how he destroyed the bondage of sin in the times of Christ. I wonder if we might have this attitude that one might have in saying, we're going to sing this song today. But we'll sing the first and last verses only, please. How would you like to be there? This, this song that we sung, we've learned it now, brethren. Moses could speak to his people. But today we're going to sing the first and last verses. What would you think about that? There's anything wrong with that? Well, there's nine here. You think we're going to sing nine verses? Yeah. If there are 12, there'll be 12. I can't get enough of that. <laughs> because what we just observed and witnessed is that glorious. But you're going to sing about Jehovah in verse 1 and how he triumphed gloriously. What do you mean by that? Well, the horse and the rider went into the sea. Dropped like lead as a stone in that mighty water. The chiefest of captains, the host of Pharaoh, they're all destroyed. God is a man of war. But we won't talk about that today. We just say he triumphed gloriously in verses 1 and 2. And at the end, Jehovah reigned forever. Let's go have lunch. We don't want to stay too long singing this song. I don't think there are people with that attitude, but I wonder if you're ready to sing nine verses today. And yet every one of what I've divided into verses is just hitting at different facets of how glorious God's salvation is. And when that happens, all nine verses will not be a burden to you or a burden to me. Because salvation is just that glorious. And we long every time to come and worship him because of that. That's part of edification from the word of God. And I trust that you will be strong in the Lord. Be strong in your Bible reading. And continue to meditate upon things that you read about. And it's so interesting how that song in Exodus 15 and what they praise God about... We've got here in the new covenant. We're purchased. We're redeemed. We've been gloriously saved. And God has made himself known in our universe to save us from our sins in a glorious way. May we never get tired of worshiping God and giving him all glory forever and ever because of our salvation. If you haven't been saved yet by the blood of Christ, come and let us help you. As we baptize you into Christ and be raised to walk in the newness of life because of his death and resurrection, we're here to assist you. Come as we stand and as we sing.